Uh, okay, uh, audio test, one, two, one, two, one, two. So we're about to start again. So our next speaker is Conrad Bellington, and he's going to talk us about audio standards, and we first start with AA67, um, a transport protocol for audio. Okay. So, uh, hi, I'm Conrad Bevington. I'm here from Focusrite. We make uh, audio interfaces and various other kinds of audio equipment. And yeah, I'm talking about AES67, a standard for networking in pro audio industry. So, uh, just to set the scene, what, uh, what we're looking at, the industry itself is, um, is studio audio, live sound, also things like broadcast and also theatres, house worship all those kinds of things that have sound systems and audio programs handling. So traditionally audio has been done over analog, uh, there's been a move to digital and more recently there's been a move to networked audio. So the type of devices we're looking at here range from microphones, uh, preamplifiers, so getting your audio in, mixers and effects to process your audio, uh, interfaces to connect it up to different things, all the way out to amplifiers and speakers um, so you can actually hear it. So here's uh, just for example a typical live sound setup. This is uh, the kind of thing we have. So we have uh, microphone inputs here um, and various sound sources which get fed into the audio network. This will be taken uh, via the ethernet over to a mixing console perhaps, perhaps to a computer so you can record um, and the audio is processed here um, and then sent back out over the network to our output system which will be for monitoring on the stage and for front of house sound for, so the audience can hear it. So that's a pretty typical setup. So in an audio network we have specific requirements. We're only dealing with local area networks. We're not putting audio over the internet. And that uh, frees us up from a lot of uh, variability with traffic levels and congestion. Uh, we want uh, low latency, we want high quality, and most importantly, uh, we want lots of channels and we cannot have lossy compression in these systems. We want good, good quality audio. So, the existing technologies, there's already stuff serving this market and there are various um, kind of proprietary technologies and so there are just various brands there and we can have a look at them in some detail. Um, so there's various levels of protocol and various solutions within those levels uh, for all of our different proprietary audio technologies and as you can see on this chart there's a lot of proprietary stuff in, in these systems. So uh, that actually uh, hurts our interop, us um, yeah, you know, connecting these audio systems together is actually quite difficult. So and that's uh, both a limitation that impacts convenience, it impacts uh, future-proofing, um, which can be quite an issue. Um, a lot of this equipment is expensive, so um, so being able to knowing that you can use it in the future is quite important. And there's a particular pain point in the broadcast industry, especially uh, with a lot of live sound in studio. You can just be careful what you buy and put into your system and how it be compatible. With broadcast, they want to go to other people's events. They want to take their OB truck, their outside broadcast truck take it to the stadium, this is from Wimbledon, and they want to plug into the audio systems and the video systems on that stadium and get feeds of what's going on so they can broadcast. So, so we can't deal with bad interop here. So AES67 is a standard developed by the Audio Engineering Society uh, aiming to bridge these, format, these um, technologies together. It uh, specifies various levels of the uh, system, 
but it specifically excludes device discovery and control um, because that's not so necessary for transporting the audio between systems. And uh, it was seen as better to get some level of standardization rather than devolving into kind of a big discussion that goes nowhere. So it, uh, those areas were excluded. The uh, technology in AES67 are actually all fairly standard existing IT uh, technologies. Um, in the audio industry, um, it's a relatively small group of companies um, compared to, say, your Googles or your Amazons or whatever. So they don't necessarily have huge amounts of engineers to put at the problem. So anywhere they can reuse an existing technology is a, a benefit. So, yeah, this is AES67 just bridging uh, the various technologies on IP. And here's an overview of what's in it. So at the very bottom layer, we have our audio format. We just use PCM, no, nothing fancy there. Uh, we use RTP packetization. Uh, we use a precision time protocol, that's an IEEE standard. And then for session description and connection management, we actually borrow from kind of the voice over IP world and we use uh, SDB and SIP. So, yeah. So I'm going to just take through each layer now. And at the bottom layer is the audio format. Uh, we standardized on linear PCM. There are two formats that are mandated by the standard. Uh, that, those are the 48 uh, kilohertz uh, sample frequency formats. And then the optional formats, the lowest quality is CD quality, the higher quality is uh, 96 kilohertz, 24 bit. And the standard leaves it open that you can implement other formats, but these are the standard ones. So once we've got our audio, we put it into packets. We use RTP for this. And uh, for simplicity, the AES67 standard actually uh, specifies that you cannot use uh, CSRC, so you can't use contributing sources, and you can't use header extensions. Uh, a lot of the audio processing happens on uh, embedded hardware devices, so keeping things simple is important here. Um, we, the, the standard mandates eight channels per stream and has short packet times. That's the amount of audio time-wise you put in a packet. So that's short to keep the latency down. And yeah, multicast is optional. Now, uh, in order to make an audio network work, um, there's uh, synchronization. This is kind of the magic thing which differentiates an audio network from a typical media setting. In a, in a typical setting, there is some tolerance for things like a, um, a sample glitch or, or a, a slight delay or those kinds of things and some jitter buffers. In an audio network, there is less tolerance for this. Um, a, a sample glitch um, being amplified up on a massive sound system uh, is quite harsh on the ears, shall we say. So, so to do this, uh, we use an IEEE standard, the uh, 1588. Um, this uses a consensus selection um, uh, system to select a master clock. And then periodically, uh, between kind of four times a second and ten times a second, the master clock initiates synchronization with all the slave devices. And, that may, and over a time period, those clocks converge. And once we have this uh, network clock, as it's called, we derive a media clock by a simple multiplication. So um, in a typical case, uh, running at uh, 48 kilohertz sample frequency, it's just defined that one second of network clock has 48,000 um, samples sample times in it. And that's just simple multiplication. So the, the uh, synchronization process is, uh, is done in two stages. First is the clock sync, where the master sends a sync packet and then notifies the receiving slave of what timestamp that had. Um, once that's done, the slave can initiate a delay request where it goes, I think the time is this, 
that goes back to the master. The master measures what the time is and it uh, sends back what its time was. And using this, we can measure the network delay. And after a few cycles, the clocks will converge because we will know our network delay, we will know where our master is, and we can converge our clocks. It typically takes a couple of seconds for a clock to converge in most situations. So once we've got our audio, we've packetized it and we've synchronized, uh, we need a way to uh, tell our different devices what our actual audio streams are, and this is where session description comes in. Uh, we mostly use the SDP standard. Uh, there are a couple of additional um, header items, are they called header attributes, sorry, in, um, in, in our SDP. Uh, uh, these specify what packet time we're using and what our, what our clock sources are and how to map payloads. Uh, the rest of it is standard SDP, so uh, if you've seen the SDP before, uh, yeah, it looks something like this. So in this case, um, we're sending eight channels of audio at uh, 48 kilohertz. Um, there's a 250 uh, microsecond packet time, so we're sending quite short bursts of audio quite often. That keeps latency down, and here we specify a precision time protocol clock domain which is our synchronization mechanism and then we just offset the uh, the um, media clock from that time domain so now to connect things together we have the connection management this is SIP again a very standard protocol used widely in video conferencing voice over IP uh, various other industries um, it's, your, it's based on URIs, and in AES67, the standard uh, recommends actually using serverless mode. So SIP allows you to put a lot of infrastructure in your network um, for tr transforming SIP requests, routing them to places, and that's kind of not recommended for this use case. It's, uh, it's overcomplicates things. So. So in AS67, serverless mode is used, and you just have direct con connections between your audio devices. So there's a simple SIP session, this is as simple as it gets, uh, is, uh, is device A just invites, uh, if device B can receive the media, device B just says, yep, yeah, okay, media flows, and then to tear the connection down, there's a buy packet and, a, and an okay. It, that's the simplest case, and um, if you look up SIP, you can see there's various, lot more complicated cases available. The other connection management we have is IGMP. This is for multicast. So it's possible to have a uh, network device uh, put out the audio onto the network uh, to a multicast feed. And in this case, um, we just use the standard IGMP, which tells the network routers uh, where, where this audio is required. There's no direct connection between the sending device and the receiving device. As far as it's concerned, it's just putting audio onto the network and whatever needs it will just pick it up. Uh, and so that uh, simplifies our stack and you know, it has all the usual advantages, uh, bandwidth usage, whatever, uh, et cetera. So that's what's in the standard. So who, who's the organizations? Well, there's two of them. Uh, there's the AES, the Audio Engineers Society. Um, they're handling the standardization and the technical discussion around the standard. And then there's the Media Networking Alliance who are more involved in the actual promotion of the standard and um, some of the more informal discussion around what should go in and how to do it. So there are a number of members of the Media Network Alliance. Uh, there's Focus right there, there's Yamaha, there's Harman, uh, there's Bosch Security, and there's also associate members. These tend to be uh, less equipment manufacturers and more uh, like actual media companies. So uh, for example, I believe Swedish Radio uh, is an associate member, as is the BBC and 
I think Walt Disney Imagineering, that those kinds of companies are all associate members. So, so the things I want to get across here are we've uh, the AS67 is standardization and that improves interop. It's bridging a gap that uh, was, was previously couldn't, just couldn't connect devices together. Um, it shows the reuse of general purpose technology in a specific environment, in this case uh, for audio. And it's also showing kind of the growing interaction between the technology industry and the pro audio industry. Um, Previously, there's some interaction, but um, with the growth of audio networks, there's a lot more in networking in general, and, and there's a lot more overlap now. So for more information, there's the Media Networking Alliance, and you can go to the AES for actual copies of the standards documents. They're pretty long and uh, deep, and, uh, as you expect from those. So I think that's it for now. Thank you. So, okay. Okay. So the question, roughly, is around um, it, um, the, there is certainly lacking open source code for this standard, um, and there is a certain amount of dominance around the ordinates um, and their pa and their patents. So. I'd say that in, in terms of opening up, um, having the open standard, the, having the standard is kind of probably the first step. And I, yes, I admit that there is a long way to go um, between, with interaction between, say, pro audio and the open source community. So I view having standard as a first step um, on quite a long path. Okay. Okay. So if you want to look at that, um, yeah, it is. 
Uh, okay, so that's a point that the AES67 is um, mostly supported in GStreamer. Uh, did you say that the connection management isn't? Sorry? Did you say connection management isn't? Okay, so all the all the standard except for the connection management is now supported in GStreamer. Thank you. I, I didn't actually know that. Did you have a question? No. <laughs> sure. So uh, I also would like to add that the in the same as GStreamer. Uh, um, but anyway, um, the, the, the main part of that is, uh, so we have, we, when we implemented it, we just implemented it, I think, either from a draft or just from yeah. the underlying document and never paid $50 because we don't, we try and avoid, where possible, paying taxes to the standard, yeah. st the standard industrial complex, as I like to call it. Um, <laughs> so, good idea for listening. Um, so, um, the main, the main question is, so we have a lot of problems with trying to interact even with professional manufacturers of sound equipment on Linux in the main. Yeah. Um, so for example, clocking is an issue that we have, although you're talking about PTP, there's a lot of applications where there's not PTP, it's technically not AS except, but do you have anything to suggest to the kernel people about how they can make ALSA in particular more suitable towards a professional use because it's a struggle? Okay, so this is a question around uh, sound development in Linux and how we might make ALSA um, better for the professional case. Oh, that's a, that's a tough one. Because <laughs> I... to implement AS67 properly, yeah. you need real support in ALSA. Like... Yeah, you need real uh, support. Well, it doesn't exist, so... Um, I, <laughs> I, this is a tough one because personally, um, being in audio more, I haven't been on Linux all that much recently. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know really. I, I, yeah, that's quite deep. Else, is quite deep into the drivers and like those areas, and I'm not so sure about. Yeah. Other questions. Thank you, Conrad. Mm. We return in five minutes for AES 70. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh,